American History TV is in Milwaukee at the Organization of American Historians annual meeting. And we are joined by Professor Eric Foner from Columbia University and Linda Kirby Kerber with the uh, University of Iowa. Thank, thanks to both of you for joining us. Mm -hmm. You'll be talking about, at this conference, about birthright citizenship in the 14th Amendment. Why don't you set the stage for us, uh, Mr. Foner, in, 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 in what is birthright citizenship? Well, in a, in a nutshell, the, this is the principle that any person born in the United States, regardless of the status of their parents, their ancestors, regardless of their race, gender, any other religion, any other category, is a citizen of the United States just by be, virtue of being born here. Of course, you can also become a citizen by naturalization if you're an immigrant. But I think historically, the important point is that this was not a principle that was that goes all the way back to the uh, Constitution, it was really implemented or institutionalized in the aftermath of the Civil War, in the Civil Rights Act of, 19, of 1866 and then the 14th Amendment, which wrote it into the Constitution. The first clause of the 14th Amendment says explicitly, any person born in the United States, with one or two minor exceptions, particularly Native Americans, who at that time were thought to be you know, citizens of their own sovereignties, but any person born in the United States is a citizen. And um, as I said, this was not necessarily the case before the Civil War. The most dramatic example, of course, it was the Dred Scott decision of 1857 in which the Supreme Court stated explicitly that no black person could be a citizen, free or slave, born here or not, it didn't matter. Citizenship was just for white people. But the birthright citizenship principle eliminates that and says, no, there are no other boundaries to citizenship other than birth in the United and States. This law and then the 14th Amendment right. written specifically for um, African Americans, the freed slaves. Well, yes and no in the sense. It was written, th th those laws were written as part of the effort of the country to come to terms with the abolition of slavery and to deal with the question of what would the status of these four million freed people be. And yet there is no, the 14th Amendment does not say anything about race. It does not say anything about black people. It is it establishes a principle, a universal standard of citizenship, which is to apply to everybody. It applies to Chinese immigrants on the West Coast. It applies to Mexican Americans who might come into the United States and have a child in the United States. So yes, the catalyst is the ending of slavery and the issues that that puts on the agenda. But the principle is one which is not just limited to black people. Well, before the 14th Amendment, who was considered a citizen? That varied from state to state. Uh, it was real, there was no national standard of who was a citizen. For example, Massachusetts always insisted that black people in Massachusetts were citizens of Massachusetts, but other states denied that, and then, as I said, the Supreme Court made that a national principle. But it really depended on the states who was a citizen and what rights they had, and one of the purposes of the 14th Amendment is to create this national standard uh, so that you wouldn't have all these variations within the country. And obviously citizenship didn't mean the right to vote, did it, Professor Kerber? Not, um, not necessarily, and that's why there is a 15th Amendment which says that no state may deprive a person of the right to vote on the basis of race or national origin or religion. Um, there was a struggle, uh, there was an effort uh, to put sex into the 15th Amendment, which would say no person has, the, uh, no state may de de uh, deny the right to vote on the basis of sex, that lost. And at that moment, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, this is 1870, and she says, this was our, ch this is a chance to make sure that the vote is a capacious vote that all citizens will have. And if we lose that chance, and here she is talking in 1870, she says, we won't have it again until 1940, she says. She pulls 1940 out of the thin air. And I've always felt that that kind of, in that way, she reaches over into our own time and, and converses with us about. There just wasn't enough political support at that time to put it in the 15th? That's right. right. Uh, there, there, People who are drafting the 15th are very conscious of the denial of rights to black people. And they knew there had been a war over this and the people had died. And women, they didn't think, had died. 
Um, so there was not, there simply weren't enough votes. Charles Sumner tried, in fact, to, to count the numbers, to count the noses in Congress and see if he could do it. And it put that particular amendment at, at, at risk. Uh, but women, the opening section of the 14th Amendment, the one that starts all persons born in the United, you know, born in the United States are citizens of the United States in the state in which they live, it says all persons. It doesn't say all white and black men. And that would have been the first time in that, that, that all persons would have been recognized as being citizens. That's right, that, that language. And so this is 19, 1868. And there are elections in 1868 and 1870, and women went to the polls. Uh, Susan B. Anthony went to the polls in New York, which were being held in a barber shop, because the idea was that if only men voted, then you put your polls, your registration, where the guys are, and the guys are in the barber shop. She goes into the barber shop, which is already shocking, and she attempts to register to vote. And in various places all over the country, there is an effort to test. I think she actually test. does vote, and she does vote, and she then votes, and then is put on trial, trial. for illegally Go, voting because right. women were not legally eligible to vote, and this becomes a court case, actually. Right. So ultimately, right. her vote doesn't count there. Well, it becomes <laughs> it's very a odd. Complicated. <laughs> it's complicated. The judge is afraid to. He rules it. He rules against her, but then he refuses to fine her or put her in jail I'm, because he's not going to create the. The fracas that 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 will, uh, but but the point is that uh, it was tested, and mm. there were women who said, "Well, leave aside the negatives of the Fifteenth Amendment. The positive first section of the Fourteenth says all persons are entitled to equal protection of the laws, and if all persons." Uh, are entitled, which is toward the end of the 14th Amendment, to equal protection of the laws, then doesn't that include our right to vote? 